Hi, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you for joining this webinar called Five Years After the Paris Agreement is Green Growth a Solution or an Oxymoron. Uh, my name is Antoine. I'm part of uh, the AFRAN, which is the Australian French Association for Research and Innovation. I will be the moderator today. So um, first of all, I would like to welcome our panelists who will be discussing um, today the commitments made by France and Australia at policy and corporate level uh, within the frame of the Paris Agreement and share their thoughts uh, regarding the concept of green growth. So Diane de Lorenz, um, Richard Trudeau and Julian Gestadi, thanks for joining today. Um, I would also like just to take a minute, <laughs> hi guys, I would also like just to take a minute to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Lea Maguero, who organized this webinar with me and uh, who will be like assisting us today as well. Um, so before we really start on the topic of the day, I would like to make a quick introduction just about what the AFRAN is about, uh, because they are the one, you know, organizing this webinar. So as mentioned, AFRAN is a French Australian Association for Research and Innovation. What they do, they are like a major actor in our bilateral cooperation. It is active in making industry academia connection, providing networking, seed funding, promising collaboration, providing insights into the French and Australian research and higher education systems, and coordinating a platforms of experts you know, to support research technology and industry communities. So there will be the link to the website uh, in the description. Guys, feel free to go uh, on the website to, to read about it and reach out really. It's a great you know, network um, and community to discuss about those kind of topics, but also a lot more and um, to share you know, different like, cultural approaches between France and Australia. So now that this is done, uh, I guess we'll dig into the, the subject on the day. Um, so as you know, five years ago on December 12, uh, 2015, um, the Paris Agreement was adopted by 197 parties of uh, the COP21. So the main the main you know, goal of the Paris Agreement was to keep or is to keep uh, global warming to uh, a plus two uh, Celsius degrees by the end of the century versus the pre-industrial period. And they really was trying to focus on limiting it to plus 1.5 Celsius degrees. At the same time, it's about discussing how we can uh, you know, try and mitigate uh, the risk due to climate change at a global level. Carbon neutrality by 2015 was a big component, a big part of like the Paris Agreement to try and achieve those targets. Five years later, which is today, obviously, um, all parties, including Australia and France, you know, within, within the frame of the European Union, are asked to uh, share and present their updated and uh, increased national determined contribution to try and meet those targets. So that's why it's really a good time now to have a look at what happened over the last five years, you know, with the Paris Agreement and maybe discuss what we can expect for the five coming years, but also a longer term. So I would like now to stop talking and let our panelists of experts like share with us more about this interesting subject. And we'll start with Diane, Diane De Lorenz. So just so you guys know what Jan is doing, Jan is a pro bono advisor for the Chief Project uh, on Public Policy. The Chief Project being um, a French you know, think tank working on decarbonization of the French economy and also energy transition in Europe. So Jan is a public policy expert interested in making the world uh, a more sustainable place. What is interesting is like she also writes about how philosophy can help us shape better public policy. Um, she founded an association of like-minded French public servants to advocate for sustainability in the French services and policies. And today what Jan is going to tell us about is uh, transition and decarbonization you know, policies uh, in Australia and France within the frame of the Paris Agreement. So Jan, welcome for joining us today and I'm now like let you speak. Thanks, Antoine. It's always a bit weird to hear someone talking about yourself. So I'll just get started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. And I don't know if you've noticed, but recently in Australia, Paris Agreement was in the news uh, last week because Australia announced that it would not use the carryover credits from Kyoto to comply with the Paris Agreement target. 
So the Paris Agreement signed five years ago is really an overarching framework and really its aim is to keep global warming under two degrees Celsius. But it's filled by what's called the nationally determined contributions, so the NDCs, and these are really the national contributions that each party to the treaty um, gives to, you, to the UN. So in Australia, it is reducing the GHG emissions by 26 to 28% 20 in 2030 compared to the levels of 2005. And in France, it's a European target of reducing emissions by 40% in 2030 compared to the levels of 1990. This is soon to be changed as we'll see. So really, and I will share my screen, the question is how are France and Australia doing in the Paris Agreement? Yep, all good. Awesome. Yeah, we'll see you then. So at the moment, uh, the parties of the Paris Agreement are not yet on track, so we are not on track. And France and Australia obviously have taken steps, but we need to do more. So the first thing is that we are not on track, either globally and nationally. Globally speaking, there is still a gap between the ANDCs and the goals of the Paris Agreement. So goals of the Paris Agreement being 1.5 degrees max and well below 2 degrees. And the IPCC in a special report in published in 2018 about 1.5 said that under the current ANDCs um, for 2030, the global warming target will be higher than 1.5. So the indices are to be reviewed this year. They're supposed to be reviewed every five years and updated. Uh, however, only a handful of countries have submitted them uh, yet. And uh, what's exciting is that European Union and England have announced new indices, but they're not submitted yet. So currently we are tracking at three plus three degrees by the end of the centuries. We are already one degree warmer than we were pre-industrial civilization, according to um, the World Meteorology Organization. And 1.5 degrees Celsius means um, at least net zero by 2030, by 2050, sorry. But that is only if the indices are respected. And in the past, they haven't been. So for example, the IPC had to update the projections of the emissions in 2030 because we have emitted more between 2010 and 2020 than we had pledged to. So this is, this is not, this is the picture globally, but also it means that we're not on track nationally, either with our own NDCs. So for Australia, Australia still needs some efforts to comply with its own NDC. Um, as you can see here, Australia has done massive things. Uh, it has reduced its GHG emissions by 17% compared to 1990, um, in 2020 compared to 1990 overall, including land use. As you can see, I've shown the graph of the two one with and one without, and the trend changes considerably. And land use is a big question that I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, because of the way it's calculated. It has also reduced emissions per capita by 40%, including land use, which is massive from between 1990 and today. But there's still room to go um, because the emissions per capita are still among the highest in the world. And um, there is the 2019 projection uh, of the 2030 Australian emissions still show that there is a gap uh, of 400 megatons that we need to still fill in. Australia's challenge is that obviously the economy is built on coal, so the mining industry with the technology and equipment and services represent 15% of the Australian GDP and 80% of the electricity in Australia is from fossil fuels. France is not on track either. Our French objectives is carbon neutrality by 2050, that became law uh, end of last year. And 40% in 2030, minus 40% in the GHG emissions in 2030 compared to 1990. And the European Union recently announced uh, that this target would be minus 50 to 55%. So in 2020, the High Council on Climate, who is the body in charge in France of assessing how well we're doing, uh, published a report, and this graph is an extract of it, saying that at the moment, uh, we have uh, reduced emissions in 2019 compared to 2018 by 0.9%, which is very far away from the trend we need to get to by 2025, which is minus 3% every year. So that is massive. As you can see, we've reduced pretty well in energy transformation in um, industry, but we still need to tackle transport and agriculture. So we are not on track either. And um, there's still room to improve for improvement. So the thing is, we have taken steps, both in France and in Australia, but we obviously need to do more. 
So Australia and France have taken steps in important ways, but in very different ways. So in Australia, really the key players, I would say, are the states and the territories. They have all declared carbon neutrality by 2050. And they also have the competencies of energy and transport and electricity, for example, is 33% of the emissions in Australia. So really they are the main actors. You also have another key player, and I will let my colleagues talk about it, which is the private sector with the economic opportunity of uh, obviously renewable energy and making Australia a renewable superpower, according to Rose Garner. And obviously civil society inhabitants also find it cheaper. So for example, 20% of Australia's inhabitants have put solar panels just because it is cheaper. In comparison to that, the federal state is doing uh, a bit, but very fragmented power legal things and not really having a comprehensive action. On the other side, uh, France is doing um, things and mainly uh, starting from the French government. So we do have um, very ambitious goals, carbon neutrality reducing by six times uh, the emissions in 2050 compared to 1990. And we have a paralegal framework, which is very massive. Uh, and I think the most important document in that framework is a strategy for low carbon, um, because it has carbon budgets, although we haven't respected them for the period from 2015 to 2018, they will be soon, from next year onwards, declined per ministry. So the Ministry for Finance will give the different ministries a euro budget and also a carbon budget. That's very uh, exciting. And for example, the public services and the companies in France are uh, above a certain threshold of uh, employees. They have to calculate the carbon footprint. This is great, also it, although it does have some pitfalls as well, such as the scope three is very rarely taken into account, but there are real strong implementation um, strategies going on. And at the European level, you obviously have the emissions uh, trading scheme, even though the price was a bit too low until very recently to be effective. And also the taxonomy on green finance, which was published a few months ago, although you do have the questions of nuclear being left uh, out of this taxonomy. So important steps have been taken, but obviously it will take more than that. Um, so what will it take? I would say that first, stronger measures are really needed. It's not the goals that we are uh, worried about, it's more the implementation. So for example, both in France and Australia, scanning all public policy decisions with this environmental uh, lens. So it also means educating public servants. And that's really interesting because that's exactly what I felt was missing in France. That's why I created this association. Um, and I don't think I'm the only one feeling like we could do more. We, have, we are the ones inventing the policy for the futures and the measures we need. So we need to be more educated about this. And also it means, especially for the public sector, having a good overview. When I was working for the SHIFT project about the low carbon plan uh, for the French economy, we realized that we didn't have this good overview. And that's how I came to um, read the carbon um, uh, assessments of the different public um, services and realized that the scope three was sometimes taken, sometimes not taken into account. The second thing we need to do better is really strong adaptive measures. Obviously, urban heat, uh, I work in development here in Australia, and we know it's a massive uh, issue. Obviously, in Australia, bushfires, everybody remembers the last bushfire season. Uh, coastline, obviously, drought as well, the Murray-Darling Basin, I, don't, I think everybody has heard about it. And in France as well, we do have drought episodes. How are we going to uh, cope with the mountains economy? key stations, etc., heat waves. So there is a lot of question. There, there are a lot of questions and we need to address them. Adaptation is in the Paris Agreement and it's not the part that we talk the most about. And overarching this, really changing the storytelling for the population, saying that obviously if we want change and we cannot stay the way we are, this needs to uh, mean change from everyone. So more globally, I think we need to rethink our whole societies, uh, meaning that understanding that biodiversity and climate are not negotiable. Um, economy is how we organize our society and you know, social protection and the state organization. This is negotiable and this we can change, but we need to do it so that we can actually be sustainable and survive in a global environment. I do think that degrowth or at least sobriety should be something that we look very strongly into because although we have a small decoupling of emissions between the small decoupling between the GHG emissions and economic growth, 
oil still remains the densest form of energy on Earth. And so we don't, at the moment, have the coupling between energy consumption and economic growth. So I'll be very interested in what um, Richard and Julian have to say about it. And leads to the question of having new values. We have built our society on carbon and since the industrial revolution and the use of fossil fuels, which obviously economic growth, social services, uh, how do we do in, economy, in a society that is stagnant, economically speaking? So as a conclusion, how are France and Australia doing to maintain global warming below two degrees? Well, the Paris Agreement is a very important framework and it, it has the merit of existing, as we say in French. But the question of actually having an impact right now is debatable, which also means that the target we chose were high enough. They were not easy targets. And the fact that we are not on track yet means that they are real targets. And France and Australia are in very different situations uh, when it comes to climate change. So electricity is the main challenge at the moment for Australia, whereas in France, we should be focusing on agriculture, transport and buildings. Different contexts and opportunities, vast land, few people, very constrained land and a lot more people. Administrative organizations, uh, we do have local government in France and they are doing things as well. But um, the fact that obviously Australia is a federal country changes a bit and different mindsets as well. We saw very recently that pragmatic action in Australia for the COVID crisis led to incredible results, although we're on a webinar today, but trust me. And so, you know, I'm very eager to see what, how Australia will tackle climate change compared to France and what strategies will be developed in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Diane. A lot of, a lot of interesting information. Um, I guess you also mentioned you know, a few interesting points that we'll have time to discuss a bit later in the webinar. So that will be good. Um, I'm going to you know, like let Richard now present uh, his work uh, because that's the most efficient way to do so. I'll give a brief introduction of Richard, Richard Prudlove. So Richard works at Climate Works Australia. He manages the, the Net Zero Momentum Tracker, which is an initiative that collates and evaluates corporate and local uh, government you know, commitments and actions to monitor progress towards net zero by 2050 uh, within key sectors of the Australian economy. So Richard, you joined Climate Works in, in 2019, if I'm right, uh, with like an impressive background. So 20 years of experience, you know, providing um, uh, experience providing engineering, project management, corporate consulting services, working across the utilities, transportation, telecommunications. Um, you also published research on the potential role of the community funded energy initiative in supporting the realization of Australian state and territory renewable energy targets. So that's a lot. And today, Richard, I guess what you're going to tell us about is uh, let us know what is Climate Works Australia doing with local governments and, and uh, corporate, so within the frame of the Paris Agreement, but also uh, present like more in depth what you are focusing on, which is the Net uh, Zero Momentum Tracker Initiative. So thanks, Richard, and, uh, and over to you. Thank you very much, Antoine. Hopefully you can see my slides and you can hear me okay. We can, all good. So, as you mentioned, I work for Climate Works Australia and I'm um, the senior project manager for an initiative called the Net Zero Momentum Tracker. Uh, Climate Works is a not for profit. It operates within Monash University's Sustainable Development Institute and we publish uh, pathways analysis for achieving net zero in Australia and provide advice and solutions to Australian companies and Australian government organisations. We facilitate collaboration between industry leaders and we're also helping some Pacific Island nations define their decarbonisation pathways. And my programme, the Net Zero Momentum Tracker, assesses organisational level commitments and action in order to track progress towards net zero across key sectors of the Australian economy. So I'm going to very briefly highlight what Paris alignment looks like for Australia based on our pathways analysis. And then I'm going to talk about how Australian companies and councils are aligning with the Paris goals. So earlier this year, Climate Works published its decarbonisation futures analysis, which examines uh, technologically viable pathways to achieve net zero within, within Australia's electricity buildings, transport industry and agricultural sectors. It found that the technological gap uh, to zero emissions has now been closed in all of these sectors, 
And in some cases, progress has exceeded expectations. So for example, the rate of deployment and reductions in the cost of uh, wind and solar energy. And solutions are also emerging, emerging in hard to abate sectors such as uh, transport and heavy industry. Uh, for example, we've now got hydrogen powered trains and electric ferries in operation in Europe. And low carbon alternatives such as green steel are emerging to replace uh, carbon intense uh, commodities and uh, uh, materials. The decarbonisation uh, futures scenario analysis shows that Australia can achieve trajectories compatible with the Paris climate goals, but it requires really strong emissions reduction, uh, reductions in this decade. So for example, a 50% reduction below 2005 levels by 2030 for a two degree scenario, and a 75% reduction within this time frame for a, a 1.5 degree scenario. Relative to uh, the, federal, the current federal government projections, these scenarios require accelerated deployment of ma mature emissions reduction technologies, such as electric vehicles and renewables, and also accelerated development of emerging solutions, such as renewable hydrogen, biofuels, and synthetic meat. So given this context, how are Australian companies and local governments responding to the urgent need to decarbonize the economy? So my project, the Net Zero Momentum tra uh, Tracker, collates and analyzes Australian corporate and local government emissions reduction commitments and actions. And it's aiming to normalize net zero by 2050 targets and supporting strategies within the Australian economy. It encourages organizations to adopt these targets and strategies by assigning net zero by 2050 ambition ratings to significant Australian companies and councils. Uh, we publicise these ratings in reports featuring influential organisations in key sectors of the Australian economy and also through our website at netzerotracker.org um, and it's all, that's also a one-stop shop to view the commitments and actions of the companies that we've assessed. Uh, so far we've assessed 190 organisations from the property, transport, retail, local government, banking, superannuation and uh, our resource sector analysis is coming out this Thursday actually um, and we'll soon be adding companies from the energy generation and manufacturing sectors and um, currently around a quarter of the organizations we've analyzed have commitments aligned with net zero by 2050 and this is um, this is a bit of a snapshot of some of them our benchmark is for companies to have a publicly stated target to achieve net zero by 2050 across all of their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so this includes direct operational scope one emissions, indirect scope two emissions associated with energy purchased and indirect scope three emissions from across their value chain, such as from use of their products, emissions associated with suppliers and those funded through investments. Net zero by 2050, has very much become the minimum global standard for emissions reduction targets. And as Deanne said, it's what, it is what is required to um, limit global warming uh, globally to 1.5 degrees. We also expect um, an overarching net zero by 2050 target to be supported by interim targets and a strategy or plan outlining an organization's intended pathway to net zero. Um, and we expect organizations to signal that they'll ultimately only use offsets or sequestration for emissions that can't be eliminated. Net zero targets are important because they encourage long-term strategy development based on backcasting from a future goal rather than incremental forward planning based on the current and most immediate context. So this encourages organizations to evaluate their, their pathways to net zero which ensures they don't get locked into unsustainable practices um, and business models. And it also helps them identify gaps um, which can direct R&D funding or highlight areas um, requiring a complete shift of focus. So this slide, <laughs> it's a bit of an overview of our ambition ratings for organizations featured in the sector reports we've published so far. Um, so I'll very quickly go through our ambition ratings, which are on the right hand side. So our gold standard fully aligned means an organization has a target to achieve net zero by 2050 for all of its direct and indirect emissions, supported by a strategy and or interim targets. 
closely aligned means they have a net zero by 2050 target with a supporting strategy or interim targets for a significant proportion of their emissions. Aligned aspirational pathway means they don't have a target to net zero uh, to achieve net zero by 2050, but they may have made a more aspirational statement to achieve this goal, or they might have an interim target that doesn't go out to 2050, but it is aligned with this goal. Partially aligned applies to organizations with net zero by 2050 targets for just a small proportion of their emissions. Not aligned basically means they're doing stuff that reduces their emissions, but it's not sufficient to achieve net zero by 2050. And no target applies to organizations where we couldn't find any publicly available information on targets or activities to reduce emissions. So to briefly summarize um, some of the highlights of our analysis, we found uh, property was one of the most progressive sectors with almost a third of companies analyzed having a pledge to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 for their owned and managed assets. Over a third of the councils we assessed representing a fifth of the Australian population have committed to, to reach net zero across their communities by or before 2050. The publication of our superannuation or pensions analysis in September coincided with three of Australia's largest superannuation funds committing to achieve net zero by 2050 across their entire investment portfolios. And we found that Australian banks and investors are increasingly taking steps to decarbonize their portfolios by divesting from thermal coal, and encouraging organizations they support to decarbonize. But by contrast, the Australian retail and transportation sectors, which have broad cross-economy influence from an emissions perspective, appear to be comparatively less progressive in terms of alignment to net zero by 2050. This slide shows how some organizations featured in our sector reports have raised their ambition uh, towards net, net zero by 2050 since we initially published their ratings. We've seen five companies moved into the fully aligned category, two superannuation companies, one property company and two councils. And another five companies have moved, um, or organizations have moved into the closely aligned category. So four property companies and one council. So I'm gonna uh, conclude by talking about some uh, significant positive trends and influences amongst the Australian companies and councils uh, that our analysis has highlighted. One is that in addition to commitments and actions that address emissions from operations and purchased energy, organizations are increasingly also addressing their indirect scope three emissions from across their value chains and working with suppliers and customers to encourage them to decarbonize. And in some cases, factoring climate change criteria into supplier selection processes. Another trend is collaboration. Uh, the scale and pace of decarbonization required to meet the Paris goals requires organizations to pool resources and work together. And many of the organizations we've analyzed are working with their peers and other stakeholders through alliances and collaboration initiatives. So for example, the Australian Industry Energy Transitions Initiative brings together companies from emissions intensive industries uh, to agree uh, ways to decarbonize their supply chains. And the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, Climate Action 100 Plus, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, and Climate League 2030, they're all coalitions of investors and other financial institutions working on tools, policies, and frameworks to decarbonize their portfolios. And they're also engaging with companies they invest in to ensure they implement decarbonization strategies. Many of the investors and lenders we've evaluated are now acting on the financial risks of ongoing investment in carbon intense activities. And then they increasingly expect organizations they back to manage their climate risks and set emissions reduction targets. So this year, the Australian super funds, CBUS, HESTA, UniSuper, and Australian Super all set net zero by 2050 targets across their entire portfolios. And many investors and lenders, including Australia's biggest four banks, have targets to divest from thermal coal by 2030. Uh, this intensify, intensifying focus on decarbonizing investment and lending portfolios is increasing the cost of capital for carbon intensive industries and means companies must now communicate how they will viably transition to net zero. And lenders are also providing products and incentives 
to encourage and assist organizations to decarbonize. So for example, a transition bond is a new type of asset designed to raise capital to help companies in carbon intensive industries shift to greener business practices. Um, Australia is one of the world's top exporters of coal and gas, um, yet more than half of its top 10 trading partners now have mid-century net zero targets, with another, the US, uh, likely to follow shortly. Early signs suggest these targets are already affecting demand for Australia's fossil fuel reserves, uh, but they also present an opportunity. Australia has reserves of commodities required by technologies to, to reach net zero, and ample renewable energy to power production of low carbon resources such as green hydrogen, green steel, low carbon aluminium. And by adopting net zero targets, Australian companies can capitalize on this transition. So to summarize, it is feasible for Australia to align uh, with two and 1.5 degree warming trajectories. Although with accelerated deployment of existing and emerging technologies relative to that anticipated by the federal government. A significant proportion of Australian companies and councils are taking steps to reduce their emissions and some significant organisations in key sectors have targets and strategies aligned with net zero by 2050. However, there's a long way to go before this target is the accepted norm within the Australian economy. Having said that, there are emerging reasons to be optimistic. Net zero targets um, adopted by Australia's key trading partners are sure to have an impact and necessitate a switch of focus from the Australian companies that supply them. And Australian organisations are increasingly collaborating with their peers, their customers, suppliers, and organisations they invest in to agree decarbonisation pathways and capitalise on opportunities from the global net zero transition. I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes uh, from this year. Um, the first one is from a director at Australian Super, and it refers to the Super Fund's recently announced net zero by 2050 portfolio target. And he said, there's a wholesale, low carbon economic transition happening. At the end of the day, for us, this is about good investment practice. The second is from the chief executive of the resources giant BHP. And he said, Climate change action makes good economic sense for BHP. So the message is that for many Australian corporates, achieving net zero in line with the Paris Agreement, it's not about ideology or moral obligation, but in the current context, it just makes good business sense. And I sincerely hope this perspective marks a significant turning point in Australia's economic transition to net zero. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Great presentation, very interesting. The net zero momentum tracker and good to have like that kind of like uh, overview of like what's happening in each sector, like very, very efficient. And for me, it's kind of a good transition to, to introduce our last panelist of the day, uh, Julien Gastaldi from uh, Carbon, uh, Corporate Carbon Advisory. So I'll give a brief introduction of what Julien is doing and, and then I'll have him speak, I promise. So, Julia has 12 years of experience working on climate change, waste management, uh, pollution pricing, carbon markets, land management, community development. It works through building a loyal partnership to redirect climate finance towards the realization of local, social, economic, and environmental benefits. So Julia, as I said, you're working at a Corporate Carbon Advisory, but you're also Chair of National Carbon Division of the Waste Management and Resource Recovery Association of Australia. Today, uh, today, yeah, I'll let you speak right now. So just today, what you're going to tell us about is about decarbonization. So what you're working on, obviously, through Carbon Management Project, tell us about the ACCUs in Australia uh, and present like a bit more about uh, Corporate Carbon Advisory and what those projects are, or the impact of those projects within the frame of, of the Paris Agreement. Thank you, Julien. Not a problem. Thank you for having us here. It's always a bit weird to uh, listen to things that have been written up somewhere else. Uh, hopefully you can see a screen. Um, and that presentation is supposed to carry on by itself, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Excellent. Um, so my presentation talk today will probably be a bit less structured than um, the first two presenters, uh, mostly because uh, I'd like to open up the horizon of what, what's possible and give you a feel for what's going on in Australia at the moment. Uh, I think it's fair to say that 
the majority of the action in Australia is voluntary at the moment. Uh, there isn't a lot of regulatory uh, drivers to decarbonize. Um, we are in a bit of a, uh, an, a pendulum uh, or something opposite way compared to France where, or Europe or any other country really, where all we really have left in Australia is a scheme to voluntarily reward negative emissions or drawdowns or removals. Uh, and then the rest is up to people's voluntarily uh, pledging to decarbonize. So um, I suppose my experience in working in this, in this space um, has been coming in 2008 and thinking we'll just have an emission trading scheme and some carbon taxes and regulation to drive emissions down. And the reality hasn't quite turned out that way. And, and it's quite interesting to see that since the actual signing of the Paris Agreement, what Australia has done is unravel and undo any regulatory pricing and really push for voluntary action in the space. Right? Um, and that has that was a bit disconcerting at the time, I think. Uh, but we eventually found ways to adapt and um, to you know go with the flow, I suppose. And that, and I think that's very Australian way of doing things, right? Um, so we'll we'll talk a bit later about where we are in our decarbonisation pathway. But essentially, the the policy system we have in place now is let's pay some farmers, indigenous groups, and uh, forward thinking corporates to reduce the emissions or capture emissions from the atmosphere uh, beyond what would have happened normally. And then we have a safeguard mechanism to make sure that in the meantime, the industrial emissions don't go up like crazy and, and then undo all the good work we're doing. So uh, that led us to a situation today where the carbon industry or the emission reduction industry really is about uh, 870 projects that have been registered under 35 different methods. Majority of those are about bush regeneration, but there's also a bit of fire management and a whole lot of natural gas and waste diversion projects. And so all those projects are completely voluntary. Uh, they come in a in kind of reverse auction system where uh, the government puts some funding available and buys those offsets. But in a funny twist or ironic twist, I should say, uh, the federal government doesn't do anything with those offsets. They just buy the units and they don't actually use them to offset anything. Uh, but what it does, it drives that uh, there's a business case, if you want, to go into emission removal, emissions avoidance, and, and to develop new solutions. Um, so that's, that's what corporate carbon business is. Uh, we exclusively work in the creation of Australian carbon credit units, which are offsets or recognized emission reductions. And we're trying to find new and innovative ways to um, create those units and bring them to scale using commercial models. Um, so we've done, we've been involved in all the different methodologies and in particular this one, which hopefully you can hear the sound. If you don't hear the sound, I can, can talk you through it. Um, but that's been a development of a world first solar carbon methodology. Can There's the sound, it's, it's a bit low, the sound. That's a, that's okay. I'll just I'll just talk over it. Yeah. I think this is subtitles anyway. Um, so this this methodology really recognizes uh, one of the unique particularities of Australian uh, land, which is it's vast, it's big, and it's been overused. It's old continent that doesn't have a lot of topsoil, and therefore, in the fight against climate change and the ability to draw back some of the carbon from the atmosphere back into the land. Uh, is really unparalleled, right? And so we can do that with trees, we can do that with grass, and we can also do that with microbes and roots and, and worms and things like that. So, uh, so that's probably one of the very exciting innovations from the Australian way of thinking into the Paris Agreement. So those units of soil carbon offset credits are fully acceptable under the Paris Agreement because they tie directly to our national offset or national accounts, and they really are a world first in terms of untapping a new pool of, or a new sink, if you want, of carbon emissions. So to, to a large extent, that's the sort of things that Australia is trying to promote. And so it is probably the first of those, uh, you know, blue carbon will probably be next. Uh, and indigenous savannah fire management is probably another Australian specificity. So in, in a sense, by not having a regulatory framework to reduce emissions in an orderly fashion, um, 
we, you know, it was a bit disconcerting at first, but really opened up the door to commercial creativity, right? And and a lot of those new ways of thinking are really coming up online. Uh, and you can see a lot of regional farmers and indigenous groups getting getting involved in those all over the country. Now, what we don't see uh, is the traditional means of decarbonizing the industry. So we don't see a lot of the electrical vehicles. Uh, we don't see a lot of renewable energy, although that's that's growing and booming. Uh, we don't see all the things that the previous speakers talked about. Right? Like the idea, you only see a handful of people who are willing to do it voluntarily, uh, but it's not a systematic approach to decarbonizing our emissions. Uh, and I think for us, that's probably the next frontier, right? What we would want to do next is um, use the leverage or leverage the mechanism that we have of creating voluntary offsets uh, and bring it back to the traditional decarbonization pathways and see how we could uh, provide a financing mechanism or an incentive mechanism using the Australian philosophy of, of getting paid for voluntary action above and beyond. Uh, and using that to drive the emissions in the right way. Uh, and I think probably that little logo, the Climate Active Carbon Neutral Certification, uh, is probably one of the ways to do that. So this is a, a label, a standard that is verified by the Australian government and is basically following the standards of reducing your scope one, two, and three emissions and offsetting the difference. Uh, to claim carbon neutrality and be recognized. And what I really, really like about that, that label is it's not just a carbon neutral certification, it's climate active. That's the, the choice, the pathway you've chosen. And by that, we mean creating a collectivity, a uh, um, community of like-minded organization to drive down the path of voluntary action uh, and do that in a way that um, is commercially profitable along the way. Uh, and I think I'll probably leave you with, with one final example of, of the power of that. Uh, there is a methodology available to create offsets uh, that is called the beef cattle herd management method. And that's in response to maybe some of the beyond meat and uh, movement. Uh, there is a methodology to produce the same amount of meat, but using less resources and emitting less methane. Uh, and the difference gives you some credit. Now, if you're going to engage in the carbon industry in doing this, you probably uh, make about two cents a kilo uh, in creating carbon offsets and reducing your emissions. And that's fine, that's not negligible, but an animal is probably worth a thousand dollars a beast, right? So two cents a kilo is kind of neither here or there. Uh, but go all the way, participate in the carbon neutrality debate, get yourself certified, and then you can find steak on the shelves of supermarkets today that are fully certified carbon neutral, organic, grass fed, Australian beef carbon neutral, uh, that fetch probably two or three dollars a kilo extra as a premium on your product when you know meat will be at forty two dollars. So all of a sudden you're talking about a ten or twenty percent uh, potential uplift on the goods that you produce as long as you engage in the green economy in a smart way. Uh, and that's probably where we want to see, right? We don't necessarily want to see people uh, putting a break on their creativity or on their business. What we want them to do is have a think critically about what they're doing, uh, address the good side and the bad side, and then create a market for green growth. Or I don't, I don't remember exactly how you, you char characterize this, but um, essentially making sure that we are progressing as a society on all levels, both environmental, social, and financial. So that's us. That's what Corporate Carbon does. Um, and probably leave the rest of some discussion, which I think you have on, on the agenda. Yeah, we do. Thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, very interesting presentation. I'd like to see the specificities of like carbon management in Australia. Um, that, and I think, thanks to all of you guys for this presentation. I give it, it was like very complimentary and give us like a, a good overall understanding to, to move to the second part of the webinar, which is a bit more of like a discussion. So there are a lot of questions that, that we we could be you know, talking about today. Uh, I'd like to ask you, all of you, like a first question. So to, to focus a bit longer on the Paris Agreement, uh, as Jan said you know, in, in her uh, presentation, so we can see that since 2015, we are not in track with the, not only not in track with the plus two degrees uh, target of the Paris Agreement, but national, uh, nationally determined contributions are 
even higher than that, we don't we are not interact with them. So we're looking at like the, the actual policies are, are looking at like a plus three degree scenario at the moment, even if with now the updated announcement, we, we could see like uh, some improvements uh, for, the, for the future or hope from, for some improvements for the future. So the first question, I guess, is like, according to you, to what you've been experiencing uh, through like what you're doing or your expertise, what have been maybe the main difficulties, the main barriers uh, to, that prevented us from, you know, meeting or being closer to the, the target that we kind of like committed to five years ago? That's a big question. And out of like all the, the action points that you mentioned, what is maybe the one or two like key points that you think we should focus on in the first place, maybe as, as a main, uh, you know, way of action? So I'm not sure, sure if there is one of you that wants to start, otherwise uh, I'll just ask somebody, but if one of you wants to start, please feel free to. I can jump in if you like. Yeah, thanks Richard. So I can, I can respond to that question at the level of companies and councils in Australia. So uh, barriers to meet the Paris Agreement, it's basically Julian referred to a couple of them. So what we're hearing from um, some companies in certain sectors is that um, the availability and affordability of um, certain low carbon technologies is lacking in Australia um, compared to other regions of the world. So a, a practical example of that, um, Australia Post feels they're doing everything they can to decarbonize their fleet. Um, but the variety of um, electric vehicles available to them is, they say it's limited, um, you know, particularly the bigger vehicles. Um, the, the sort of current life cycle costs of those solutions in Australia are, are quite, you know, uh, not very compelling, they're quite high. And, and, and the supporting infrastructure like charging infrastructure just isn't in place. Um, similarly, um, some very necessary and basic policies um, have not been rolled out. So uh, buildings, the building sector is a good example um, where, you know, standards around energy efficiency and electrification of new buildings is not there. Um, and I live in a brick tent, basically, <laughs> you know, with no insulation, which coming from Europe is quite confronting and no double glazing, etc. And another well-publicized um, barrier is its policy certainty at a federal government level, especially energy policy. So we're doing, uh, we're looking at the energy sector at the moment. So you'll find companies like AGL, they'll have, you know, covering some of their emissions through a net zero by 2050 target, but you'll, you'll see this caveat that, um, you know, they're unable to independently make decisions around closure of coal-fired power stations to achieve that target under the current um, government policy. So that's just three examples. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, yeah thanks, Richard. That's great to, to hear that. Um, I don't want to, to like speak too much. I would like you guys to, to, to do it. So I'm just gonna let you, the, the next one who, who feels like he wants to speak about this. I can follow up. Um, I feel like, I would say three things. Uh, the first thing is that obviously it's very rapid change in very little time. So like, as Richard mentioned, there's plenty of reasons to be cheerful and there's plenty of emerging technologies. The reality is, are they scalable rapidly enough to actually make a difference, make a difference before it's too late? And that's what we are battling with at the moment, right? Um, it's like, we can do plenty of things, but how fast can organizations change and can we um, roll out new infrastructure to support that? Let's me to the second point, which is private and public sector needs to move together. Um, there, Julia made the good point about, you know, obviously in France, we've got this very um, centralized state uh, thinking that, and I'm, I'm the first one uh, thinking that we need to have laws and mechanisms, so the carbon tax incentive and repressive to actually achieve that. Um, whereas Australia is, even the uh, NSW investment plan that was voted a few weeks ago, it was, it's really just, renewable energy zones and just incentive it's like please invest and we hope that we're going to have investment from private companies um, but actually private and public sector needs to come together and so if you just think about the public sector and legislation how are you sure that you maybe maybe you have pledged carbon neutrality i mean net zero in 2050 how are you sure that your actions are going to have that impact very difficult to say 
reverse conversely if you're starting from the private sector you have all these initiatives and people saying they're going to do this and that how are you sure that globally you'll meet your target so that this problem is not new it's like how can we be sure that you know what we do in law or what we do even in um not law but pub, you know private policies at the company level or the local government level is going to have a real impact in the long term and then the last thing is, um, as I tried to share with land use um, and forestry, uh, land use and forestry, for example, if you um, go to uh, climate action tracking, they're not taking them into account because they say, well, it's only 70% of the global emissions and uh, we should re talk about reducing the main ones before we tackle this. And also there is uncertainty about how it's calculating. So there is a need for a framework nationally and internationally, and I know there's many people working on this in many sectors, but to actually calculate and model the emissions um, you know, in a precise and detailed way, because then you've got these uh, questions around what do you take into account, what don't you take into account, how you value this, how you value that. Same thing goes for all uh, the importations. So for example, in France, the French imports are not taken into account in the you know, national emissions. However, basically the drop in national emissions in France have been overcompensated by an increase in, the, in our imports, meaning actually overall the carbon footprint, if you take them into account, hasn't changed. So, you know, if you're just green because you're just getting all your emissions to China and importing them back, it's fine by you, but there's a problem in that as well. So the scope and the way of calculating emissions is very important. So I would say there were three things. And obviously, in terms of storytelling, um, it's hard to read an IPC report and it's hard to understand all the modelizations. I'm not an expert. I'm not a climate scientist. There are many people working on this, also oceans, biodiversity. So it really needs to have a common story and good vulgarization that people can understand uh, and can relate to and understand what it means for the everyday life. That would be my points. <laughs> You're still on mute, Antoine. Yeah, I clicked on it, but I missed it. <laughs> my bad. Yeah, Julien, uh, thanks, Jan. Julien, uh, is there anything that you want to add to, to that topic? Uh, probably not add. I think uh, Richard and Jan uh, really expressed it really well. Um, you know, to go back to your original question, uh, you know, what were the barriers of making progress on, the, on those targets? Well, don't mention the climate laws, right? That's kind of the main thing, policy certainty and being able to set the cap and stick to it. Um, it's been a massive issue. Um, not so much because of the policy, but the fact that it's changing, right? So you lose a couple of years uh, readapting and redesigning how you can respond to that. Uh, Definitely agree with some of the other comments uh, that we're making around in Australia. Do we feel that like we're making a difference and do we feel we're making a difference where it matters? Uh, it sounds like we, you know, making a lot of progress on land use uh, and, you know, land use change. Uh, a lot of that by simple instrument like clearing laws in Queensland. Um, and the rest of the world doesn't really either notice or or really is interested in that sort of things. Uh, so how do we how do we paint a story around that? And I think probably the most powerful of those for us at the moment is air fire management. Uh, we really have a good story to tell there and we could explore that easily. Uh, but I think we can't escape the fact that, you know, Australia is 2% of the world's emission. Our current carbon activity is 2% of Australia's emission. Uh, so we two sheds of nothing and it's really hard for the everyday Australian to understand how how they're making a difference. Uh, on the plus side, as a country, we can afford it, right? So it's just a, a question of creating value and aspiration in that target so that people are, are willing to part with their dollars. I think probably something I would I would mention here to rebond on what Diane was saying is, I think carbon tariffs are coming uh, for people who are not following the trend. And uh, that's probably one way of ensuring the global goal of being carbon neutral is achieved together. Um, they really we've got two ways to get in there, right? Either each in our own bubbles you carbon neutral and the sum of zero equals zero, or we start collaborating and you know we come up with a process that together the emissions are, are not increasing post 2050. Um, and of course, the second one is probably more aspirational and interesting, but also a thousand times harder to implement. Uh, and at some point, people are going to start 
arcing up and putting barriers. And I can definitely see European Union doing that uh, and starting to play hardball on, on some of those goods from Australia. Um, so maybe as a segue into other things, I also think it's really interesting what was said before that uh, the difference between where the country is at in Australia is all about decarbonizing the electricity sector and then enabling the rest of the country or the activities to be electrified. Uh, versus in Europe, it's all about decarbonizing the hard to abate sectors and the agricultural space and that sort of things. Well, it sounds to me like Australia is doing well in agriculture. <laughs> France and Europe is doing well in energy. Maybe this could be a, a two-way exchange of knowledge. Um, and I think that's happening in, in the solar industry in particular. A couple of, of French companies are really kicking goals here. So, um, so hopefully, rather than tariffs, we, we get into partnerships. <laughs> that will be a very aspirational thing to do. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Thanks, all of you. Yeah, a lot to be said on this question, but yeah, I think you're right. There's a lot that uh, at the end of the day is about cooperation and exchanging. And that's also why we're trying to do that here, you know, between Australia and France with that kind of discussions and have like those kind of, um, uh, you know, like learning from each other. So this will lead me to my last question, because unfortunately, uh, you know, our time together is coming to an end. So uh, I would like to finish with like just a, a bigger picture, uh, like a bit of like, um, yeah, like things that we can all think of. So which is the concept of green growth? Uh, so if you see the Paris Agreement and the last five years have been implemented within that idea of a green growth, within the idea that we can keep on having the economic growth the way we've defined it, uh, you know, for, for like uh, a lot of many years now. And at the same time, uh, limiting, if not stopping our impact on the environment. And by that mean, uh, being able to keep all the resources, all the, the goods that the environment is providing for our well-being. So what I would like is just to have like, your your thought of, of that on that concept of the green growth and maybe also do you think that um, the idea of decoupling uh, you know our use of finite resources and energy with economic growth is actually possible when we look at for instance the earth overshoot day we can see that you know on the long trend it's getting earlier and earlier each year even after 2015 um, so yeah, is that decoupling really possible according to you and within the frame of like the green growth? I don't know, should I, should I select somebody or is, is somebody excited by the topic? <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can start again maybe. I think uh, we should probably start by challenging the, the concept of growth. Uh, we should at least make that point and you know, note that we're still lacking systems to value natural capital and ensure that is used in conjunction with traditional measures such as GDP. Um, but if we're only talking about GDP, um, I'm conscious of the fact I'm coming across as a bit of an optimist, but anyway, um, one of the highlights for me this year was seeing those big um, Australian institutional investors uh, in the superannuation sector um, achieve net zero, uh, set these targets to achieve net zero across their portfolios. And to me, this, you know, it just says that these economic risk and return, uh, experts in economic risk and return, they've got to the point where they're sufficiently confident um, that net zero in the current context is now the most economically favorable scenario if you, you know, take their, prom um, their targets at, at face value. And, and it's back, been backed up by statements we saw um, ANZ's chief executive facing down criticism of the bank's divestment uh, strategy from government ministers by saying it's all based on prudential uh, financial risk management, BHP saying they're gonna thrive under a 1.5 degree scenario. So it sort of feels like the economic arguments against, certainly in Australia, the economic arguments against um, net zero uh, are rapidly being undermined, fingers crossed. Um, and you, we've also seen, uh, with my work, we've seen company attitude shifting from asking why they need to align to, to how they're going to do it. So there's a bit of a growing acceptance that the global economic uh, net zero transition is happening come what may, whether it's decoupled from growth or not. Um, and there's this sense that, you know, it's better to start to shift now than kick the risk and the cost down the road. So again, some reasons to be cheerful. Maybe I'll give the others a chance to, to comment. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, 
reach out. It's good to be cheerful from time to time. Uh, Diane, I can see that you, you're ready. Yeah, I guess, you know, <laughs> the pattern worked pretty well, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be a, a more pessimistic uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I work for the Shift Project and, um, and I've listened to a lot of Jean Covici, so I guess um, French people probably know who he is and he's, uh, he's a really strong advocate for at least sobriety, uh, if not degrowth, basically stating and, you know, with a strong em emphasis on energy. I'm basically looking at long term and seeing that economic growth is very is a very exceptional time in history. We've had basically no economic growth. Comes the 19th century, we discovered fossil fuel, coal, and then oil during 19th century, and certainly, um, you know, um, our economic growth is up. Whereas, you know, our really our standard of living had not basically changed that much in the past uh, centuries. So basically linking that, linking comic growth to the fact that certainly we had this very, very dense um, source of energy that at the moment is unrivaled. Um, it does make sense that now we are not seeing much economic growth around the world, especially not in Europe, and that maybe we've reached the end. And I definitely hear the argument for, you know, green growth and dematerialization, but also, well, what we called something digital and digitalization is not necessarily green. You still have servers somewhere that need to be um, cooled down. So um, starting with this, and there is also the, the writer Thierry Caminel, Thierry Caminel, don't know how I should pronounce it, in France, who's basically written um, about this um, link between energy and economic growth makes me think that probably we should look uh, at something else. And as Richard says, uh, GDP and economic growth is not like the ultimate goal. It may have been in the past, but if we look at a more um, bigger picture, at a bigger picture with the environment, we may need to rethink what we live and what we value. And I find that very interesting because I'm working on it in philosophy, uh, the concept of value being both the economic value, but also the social value and seeing how basically since 19th century, they've been pretty much together, social progress, medicine, quality of life, appliances, wonderful. Uh, and now we're getting to a point where actually economic value, uh, except in Australia, but uh, we'll see, is you know shifting a bit away from the ecological value because we need to value the environment and we need to recognize it. So I really hope I'm wrong, but I would say that probably we need to think of a world not only for GHG emissions just also for just you know taking from the limited resources we've got in terms of oil and um, other sources of energy that they're limited and so I think we now need to adapt to a world with our economic growth but maybe it'll be a growth in you know other metrics so yeah hoping I'm wrong I would say that's my point at the moment <laughs> thanks, Jen. thanks and Julian to finish yeah, look, I'm, I'm not a pro at those things, but I'll have a go anyway. Um, I think to me, the first step to decouple green growth from, uh, um, sorry, growth from uh, fossil fuel is to stop talking about it together. Right? Um, uh, especially you take Australia and, and Europe as two examples. Well, we have no growth in, Australia, in France for 20 years. We had a lot of growth in Australia for 20 years. You know, the reality is we don't really know how economic growth happens. Uh, but what we do know for sure is we can't afford to continue to pollute, right? So let's just, you know, deal with them separately. Uh, hopefully find ways to either grow economically in a carbon reduction movement or, you know, start looking at other ways for spiritual growth or value growth, as, as Diane was saying. I think it, it's, it will be interesting to this group probably to just think about the fact that when you share knowledge, you grow and you haven't used any resources necessarily so there is a pathway where uh, the quality of the exchanges increases without necessarily having to take from a limited pool of resources and I think we can reinvent that um, in you know in a way that benefits everyone I think uh, an interesting bit that I see happening in our carbon markets here is this kind of philosophy creeps into even the value of a carbon credit. So we have this concept at the moment uh, called co-benefits, where for some reason people felt like a world leading standard on, on emission, verified emission reduction certificates wasn't good enough. <laughs> you also had to show that in planting your trees, you were also having social and ecological 
benefit and biodiversity impact and indigenous engagement and these sort of things. And and I think this really this this dichotomy between price and value, I think is growing more and more. And and that's how you I think you'll 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 get that decoupling happening, right? The people valuing things that may not necessarily be a financial growth along the way. Um, and yeah, and on that, I think we can lead to look to a couple of examples. Uh, maybe one thing that's been completely overlooked along the way is over the last 50 years, advertising has made us believe we wanted things that we didn't need. Uh, maybe we can take a leaf from that book and then convince people that they want things we actually need. That would be a nice, nice tool to use. Um, now, I know you want to wrap up, but we had quite a fierce fight around the book selection for, for summer reading. So I hope you let us get to that. <laughs> uh, for sure. No, no, I'll let you do it. Yeah. You know, I just, yeah, just want to conclude on those questions by thanking you. I know, you know, there are, there are, there are big questions that just take a short period of time to try and like develop a, a thought. And, but, uh, as you said, I think that the value and what we value as a, as a global society, the symbols, all that kind of topics will be important in the future. And really you guys, um, knowledge, experience, and expertise in, in your you know, areas like brings a lot to, to, uh, to those type of discussions. So thank you. And now, as Julian was saying, I would like you guys to tell the audience a book so about what we've been discussing about or not, <laughs> and, uh, and like a book that you like and, and what you like, so we can all learn from it. Julian, so please start. Julian, you were excited about it? So. Start. I am excited about it only because Diane stole my book, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, go for it. I think it'd be interesting uh, to share the two perspectives on it. And I've got a backup as well, so we can share both. That's all right. Um, so, look, a, a large part of my work in, in carbon emission reduction has been working with Indigenous groups, uh, especially in Northern Australia. Uh, and I've come across this fantastic book from um, uh, Julia Watson, uh, who's an Australian who resides in New York City, and she's a holder chair in, in some university there around design and urban design. And she, she's published this wonderful curated book about how you can use um, traditional designs to inspire the way you build cities and, and public spaces. And, and if you just look at the cover, what, what you're looking at here is, is actually a two or three level bridge that has been built across uh, a river that's prone to monsoon flooding just by weaving two species of, of trees and, and um, vines together. Uh, and that really uh, kind of opens up the possibility of, of just taking a bit of a step back and saying, of course, we can use science and knowledge and research and firm accounting and regulation to get us to the place we need. But there's also a pool of knowledge called wisdom that resides in the indigenous cultures all around the world uh, that may not have the same uh, mathematical basis, but is still as valid a source of knowledge, in particular, an extremely localized form of knowledge that uh, allows you to create solutions that adapt to uh, that particular hill or that particular river system you're working on. So I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's an easy read. It makes you travel and it's great to have it on the coffee table. Thank you, Ian. Um, Diane, Richard, who wants to go first? You can go, Diane. All right, so an alleged man that this was a book that Julian and I both chose. So um, I'm still trying to say what he thinks That's about been a it. Bit of but, a um, <laughs> yeah, so I just, I just finished reading. Um, Fire Country by Victor Stephenson. So this is really uh, obviously an Australian book and about Australian country and how to burn different types of bush and different types of country. And it's okay. It seems a bit, you know, far away from the discussions we had tonight, but it was in a more um, the approach I'm taking about talking about values and what we value in society and how to live uh, with nature. And also, you know, obviously creating jobs because if you want to uh, burn regularly a country. Uh, it takes people to go on the ground, let up, let up the fire, check it, and uh, a lot more than what we're doing at the moment. Um, I would say the Western way, which is just back burning. So um, it's very strange focused, but it teaches you a lot about what it means to know about the country you live in. And maybe, you know, it's an opportunity for us to 
work on this link to the land that we kind of lost. In the book, he's going to um, other indigenous um, communities. He's going to Scandinavia and have this discussion about when did people start to be disconnected from the land because they find that they have the same issues. Um, so it's very interesting to read that and to also realize that now we may know lots of things, but if you put me in the trend bush today, I would not know which country I'm on and how to take care of it. So especially given, you know, Australia has known particularly devastating bushfires, this is really showing us how to um, manage the fire, not the fire, the country better so that we don't have so much load that is ready to burn in those enormous bigger fires and we can just have our biodiversity coming back and have plenty of species thriving, which is a little bit of human care and knowledge. How do you recommend that? Uh, lucky last, I wanted to stay out of the uh, the fight over who who could claim that book. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and recommend that you read the Net Zero Momentum Tracker sector reports only because, um, as well as including the company pledges and our analysis of them, we actually put quite a lot of effort into reviewing and condensing the latest literature and media for each sector that we cover to to kind of um, you know give an up to date. Uh, perspective on progress in the sector and decarbonisation options and uh, to extend the shameless plug we'll be publishing our seventh one this week on Thursday so look out for that on our website to make amends for my you know barefaced shameless plug I'm also going to recommend a podcast it's a BBC podcast I really enjoyed it it's called how they made us doubt everything and it discusses how tactics used to undermine the link between smoking and cancer were used to seed climate change skepticism so it gives some insight into why you know why we're rushing to catch up at the 11th hour to, to achieve uh, the paris goals thanks richard thanks guys a lot a lot of good like things to read and to listen to uh we'll put the link in the description so the audience you know can can look out for those uh books and audio and uh and make sure to read them so it's time for us to to wrap this webinar up, unfortunately. Thanks again for joining. Uh, thanks the audience for, for being with us uh, today. And uh, again, we'll, there will be the link of, you know, the Afran uh, website in the description. If you want to, to get more information about Afran, also if you have questions maybe for uh, this webinar and for our panelists, feel free to reach out on the Afran, um, you know, website and we'll try and get back to you. Um, and yeah, stay tuned. We'll, we'll, we'll be back with you know, more webinars and more discussions like that. Thanks all for joining today and we'll speak soon. And thank you Antoine for organizing. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks thank a lot. Yeah, thanks Antoine and Leah and thanks Richard and Julian for such interesting uh, and different point of views.